Hi everyone, this week I'm going to end the lecture on the future of globalization and I will move on to the future of work. Last time I left off at the uh, occurrence of telerobotics and remote intelligence. So I talked about teleoperation uh, that indicates operation of a machine at a distance. The robot avatar can move, look around at the command of the remote person. Uh, that is typically the third unbundling consequence where a worker is going to be unbundled from his work. I mentioned the case of a long distance surgery in Canada. So you can click on, um, on this link. So here. And I also mentioned that it could be uh, also um, remote warfare. So, you know, many of those inventions were created for the purpose of conducting warfare um, on other countries. And after they're being used for um, war purposes, or maybe war deterrence purposes, then they get into the um, civilian sphere and then we get to benefit from those inventions. Usually this takes time. Drones, very similarly, are being used for very different purposes, especially in war. Uh, drones are being used to um, bomb other places from a uh, maybe especially places like the Middle East um, from their uh, cozy base in the US, because I'm mostly talking about the US here. OK, so. The third unbundling unbundles labor and laborers. So it unbundles workers and where their work applies pretty much. So specialized in skilled services are the most likely to be affected. So we can call this a virtual migration. You, your work could be applied to the other side of the planet and to a totally different country while you stay in your own country. Um, this already exists. You don't need crazy inventions for that. I know somebody right now, for instance, who just arrived in Canada and who's currently working from er for Ernst & Young, uh, which is a consulting company. This is a company you might be interested in once you're um, done with your degree, especially if you do economics or business. But she works for the Costa Rican office. So she moved in Canada recently and kept her job um, for Ernst & Young. So she is working um, remotely, like many other people. Like I could, re I could work remotely as well. Well, I'm at the office right now, but I could go back home in the summer and teach remotely from there. Especially uh, in particular, the um, COVID-19 pandemic accelerated this third unbundling by um, closing office spaces. Let me do something quickly. I took the wrong slides. There we go. Oh. What's going on with this? Yes, okay. Just wanted to get points uh, Schweb one by one. Okay. Okay, here. So, the third unbundling is going to allow brain jobs um, to be offshored. Telepresence is relevant for offshoring because humans are involved. Now, would it be highly skilled, highly skilled northern individuals operating in the south, as in G7 countries workers working for a southern country, for uh, maybe an I7 and so on? Or will it be an I7 um, worker working for G7 country? Well, here, look, for instance, at the um, wage of three different jobs uh, in two different countries. So US would be a G7 country, 
while Philippines would be one of the um, i7 or one of the develop developing ones. A university professor on average uh, per month makes um, $6,100, school teacher $4,100, an engineer $6,200. I'm not sure about how recent those uh, figures are, but the idea is to compare those wages with the Filipino wages, $400, $300, and $570. So do you think you're going to see a Filipino engineer work for US company or an American engineer work for a Filipino company? I'll let you find uh, the answer to that question. But chances are that uh, the South should be able to exploit arbitrage opportunity. And this is what um, I'm going to get to in the next slide. So the third bundling is likely to be based on micro outsourcing. The ability to get uh, individuals to perform small disjointed tasks as part of a larger project with all this taking place over the web. I mentioned the use of Trello, Slack, um, Zoom and other um, collaborative platforms. Typically, those platforms can allow teams of people from um, different places in the world to work on the same project. People can just each bring their contribution. It could be sometimes pretty small, sometimes it could be big, and uh, that would represent offshoring pretty much. In fact, in research, that has been happening for a very long time. When you have a co-author who works in another university, you have to collaborate with him. So back then I would work by telephone, then uh, emails came around. Now you have collaborative platforms where you can have a project online and your co-author and yourself can constantly update the project with whatever you contribute to it. This is very typical in research. Well, here that will be a firm hiring people from different countries to work on the same project. So virtual presence will make the fractionalization of activities and offshoring much easier to coordinate. The same way right now, it is way easier for me to coordinate my class with you guys. Um, well, there is 200 of you in this cohort <clears throat> today, only 68. But you guys are all over the world. I checked the survey I sent you recently with where you are studying from and where you are from. Sometimes these countries are not the same. You might be studying from Canada while being from Australia. Um, <clears throat> virtual presence made this whole thing happen quite smoothly. This way, Africa and South America, who um, seem to have not joined the global value chain revolution yet, can do so. Given that G7 service sector wages are often tenfold or more uh, those of highly workers and highly educated workers in developing nation, there's going to be a scope for arbitrage opportunities for developing nations in particular, and in particular, highly skilled workers, which will be in demand for um, virtual presence. There should be a lower impact for services, uh, service sectors as physical presence is still needed. If you think about social and healthcare services, you still need to have some proximity. You still need to have somebody to, to take care of you. So, you know, um, if you need, if you are at the hospital and you need somebody to change your, sh your bed sheets, you're going to need a nurse or a care aide to take care of that in person. Hairdressing. If you want to get a haircut, well, chances are you're going to need a human to uh, take care of that. Maybe one day we're going to be in a case where a hairdresser could manipulate some sort of a, uh, an avatar, a robot, maybe some kind of Edward Scissorhand robot uh, remotely and still perform, um, still make pretty good haircuts. That might happen, but that might represent a pretty high cost, especially when you look at the price of a haircut now, at least for a guy. I can still get 
haircuts for fifteen dollars, um, sometimes even ten dollars if you find some places. Um, I know that for women, haircuts are a bit more expensive. I recently watched, um, is it a Disney movie, Pixar, DreamWorks, I don't know, called Big Hero 6. I actually liked it. I'm not a big fan of those animated movies anymore. Um, I find it pretty cheesy and not really, I don't think I'm the target. But I liked, I, liked team, uh, I liked Big Hero 6, and one of the interesting concepts about this movie was that there is this... Um, what's his name? The white, the white avatar. B-Max? I already forgot. <laughs> so anyway, this, uh, in this movie, there's a guy who comes up with an invention. Baymax, thank you very much. Which is a robot uh, that can um, offer customers customized care for um, on a personal basis. So this uh, robot can take care of your vitals, can uh, analyze you constantly, can keep track of your sleep, can keep track of your pulse, of your blood flow and so on, and can offer you assistance without having a, um, an actual person, an actual human being, um, taking care of these tasks. Before we get to a fully automatized um, robot, we can maybe get to a remotely controlled avatar. So Baymax, before being fully autonomous, could maybe remotely controlled by somebody in a hospital. Uh, it could be nearby or far away. So you might not need to go to the hospital to get a, um, to get, let's say, a uh, blood test. Maybe this avatar could take care of all of that. So let's get into the concept called arbitrage. So first of all, arbitrage is a French word, like many other words. So in French, we say arbitrage. Arbitrage, the, the strict translation of arbitrage in French means referring. So when you have a fight or a soccer game or anything like that, we don't call the referee the referee. We call it, we call him the arbitre because this is the guy who is going to decide, who is going to make decisions about the rules. Now, arbitrage in English, in economics in particular, is a bit different. It is this situation where people take advantage of different buying and selling prices in different markets to make small amounts of profits. Absolutely, that could be the same as buying stuff on Walmart, from Walmart and selling them on Amazon. Typically, you know that the same item is worth more in a different marketplace. So you buy it where it's cheaper, you resell it somewhere else, hoping to make some profit. Arbitrage first, I mean, dates back to, uh, dates back to the origins of trade, but um, arbitrage is particularly prevalent in finance. In finance, back in the days where communication was not um, instantaneous, you could find a stock sold on the New York Stock Exchange for a lower price than the, mark, the stock price in Singapore. So maybe you, know, you could exploit the window, especially overnight, because in one place, one stock market would be um, closed while the other would be opened with the time difference. Some people would exploit this, uh, this window to buy stocks at a lower price and resell them uh, once the stock market opens in another place. There have been many measures to counter such arbitrage opportunities, especially in finance. But if you think about trade back in the days, merchants who would go from one place to, um, to another might be able to, you know, find a marketplace where a, a good is very abundant because maybe there's a production nearby due to favorable uh, climate or favorable agricultural conditions in general. They could buy a good for a low price and go to a marketplace where this good is pretty rare, so they would be able to resell it for a high price. That's arbitrage. 
The difference between the buying and the selling price should be large enough to cover the costs involved in executing the trades. Transaction costs. This is also the case I heard about um, Costco in Canada versus Costco in the US. So I've been to Costco twice in my life and I love it. I just don't have a membership. But I heard that Costco in the US sometimes sells some products which are exactly the same as Canada's. Costco, so same brand, same packaging and everything, for a lower price. And apparently, for certain goods, certain categories, going from Vancouver to uh, Bellingham or Seattle, which I believe is, is where the closest Costco's are. Um, so, pay for transportation, gasoline, and even pay for the exchange rate, which is more favorable for the US dollar, Canadians would still be able to come back to Vancouver and resell some of these goods for a nice price and make small, small amounts of profits. Of course, there are regulations between the US and Canada regarding the value of um, things you can carry over the border. So there would, if you get checked, if your trunk gets checked and you bought way too many things uh, as opposed to what you're allowed, then you, may, you, might subject to a, you might be subject to a fine and you might not be able to carry some of those goods over. Absolutely. I think it was called uh, Parajos. So somebody in Vancouver uh, tried to open a Trader Joe's store and tried to sell Trader Joe's goods, which you cannot find in Canada. And I believe the store was called Parajos or something like that. Eventually they got caught and they had to close down. I love Trader Joe's and I still don't understand how come Trader Joe's doesn't sell more of its stuff here or maybe doesn't sell them at all. Because Vancouver is typically the kind of marketplace where Trader Joe's would sell. So I have no idea why Trader Joe's is not trying to open, um, open a place or branch in Canada. But yeah, definitely I know that there is definitely a high demand for Trader Joe's. Every Vancouver ride that I know that goes to the US every now and then, make sure, make sure they pass by Trader Joe's in Bellingham or Trader Joe's in Seattle. Fun fact, Trader Joe's sells cheese from the Basque Country. Cheese from factories I worked for. So when I went there and I saw cheese well, I was, uh, that was from my hometown, I was like, ooh. Yeah, it's pretty expensive. That was the first reaction. But second was like, oh, that's, that's cool that they get stuff from, uh, from up there. So in our uh, context, wage differences reflect the cost of living differences and migration restrictions. So somebody who is highly skilled but is living in a developing country might be able to work remotely for a developed country, get paid the wage of a developed country, while living in a developing country with lower standards of living. Virtual presence creates the possibility by, of bypassing migration restrictions without caring about the cost of living differences. You live here, you work there. So, conclusion about force two. Telepresence technology is improving, getting cheaper and accelerated over the year 2020 because of the pandemic. The third unbundling amounts to unbundling labor and worker or labor and laborer. That corresponds to virtual migration. Skilled services are gonna be like, are likely to be affected, in particular services because uh, we don't need to be um, in person to execute tasks, some service tasks. For example, teaching as I'm doing now. Teaching as I am doing now might not be as good quality as in-person teaching because of maybe a lack of interaction with students or maybe a different rhythm um, regarding the way the content is covered. Um, invigilating tests and preventing cheating is still pretty difficult. So it might not be optimal, but it's made possible.
The top three nations hiring telemigrants are the US, Australia, and the UK. Three biggest sources, unsurprisingly, are developing countries, Philippines, India, and Bangladesh. The last thing I want to mention quickly is the emergence of computer integrated manufacturing, which is um, pretty much ruling the whole production process with computers. Not just machines being operated by people, like we had in the second unbundling, but rather computers um, organizing, organizing the whole um, production process. There's a radical reduction in the fixed cost and time delays associated with new products and models. Oh, US, Australia, and the UK. United Kingdom for the top three nations. There is a shift away from mass production of identical goods to mass production of customized goods, but all of these can be programmed in a machine. The machine, you can just press a button and say, boom, I want to go from green to blue. I want to change the color. And you can already start customizing goods a bit. Although, of course, the core of the good is still the same. There's a heightened possibility for spatial unbundling of certain segments of the value chain as digitized information makes coordination at distance less complicated. A bundling of many tasks previously undertaken by individual workers of different skill levels into advanced machinery and computers leading to a threat to jobs. Of course, there is always gains and pains. But the idea of computer integrated manufacturing is very related to um, what a, um, what is it called? Is it a crock pot or an insta pot? One of the spots are big and actually have a whole programming and they can even make chocolate mousse. Instapot, maybe. Thank you. So, chocolate mousse is a very easy recipe to make, but it requires you to beat the eggs in a specific fashion, then to fold the uh, egg whites with the chocolate in a very specific fashion to create this moussey aspect. That's my go-to recipe. It's very easy to make and always works. Don't order a chocolate mousse in a restaurant. It's not worth it. It costs, it costs 50 cents to make at home, honestly. And usually you're going to pay $5 for it. Anyway, I'm getting carried away. Some of the spots, you can make lasagna, you can make chocolate mousse, you can make all the different things by just pressing a couple of buttons. And the pot is going to just uh, tell you what to do. It's going to tell you what to put first and then operate according to the instructions, according to the recipes which are programmed into the pot. Those spots are expensive. It's probably something like three, $400 but they can make rather complicated recipes for you. Same as you have some bread machines that can make all kinds of doughs. You can ask for a pizza dough, you can ask for a bread dough, a sourdough dough, and so on and so forth. That's it for the future of globalization. Now, let's move on to the future of work. So I talked about the third and bundling as a new uh, change for globalization. And we talked about virtual migration, telepresence, um, holographic telepresence, and so on. That is going to unbundle work from um, the laborer, from the worker. Now, how is this going to affect the structure of the labor market? So. And by structure, I mean the quantity of jobs, so unemployment levels, employment levels, labor force participation. And how is it going to affect the structure of jobs? What are jobs going to be made of mostly? The usual disclaimer. So the plan is to go over industrial revolutions. Then I'll talk about 
how they, each industrial revolution affected the labor market. And then I'll talk about a potential fourth industrial revolution. So there are actually three right now, which are confirmed, which are like, you know, um, which are recorded pretty much. How is a potential fourth industrial revolution, um, how is it going to affect the future of work? And of course, we will need to um, organize economic policies around this fourth industrial revolution if we want to make sure unemployment doesn't grow too much and so on and so forth. <laughs> so if you remember the beginning of the course, we talked about four phases. That was the... Um, That was pretty much the first and second um, weeks of lectures. In phase one, we had pre-agricultural revolution. Consumption goes to production. So hunter-gatherer societies would just move from one spot with food to another. And food would include um, fruits, things like berries, vegetables, and so on. And, um, of course, wildlife, so um, animals and so on. In phase two, we saw the agricultural revolution appear. So production goes to consumption. Now we had uh, more settlements. Agriculture also made it possible to have less people to produce uh, more food. So instead, so now with 10 people, we can have um, production of food for more than 30 people, okay? We had a development of tools that helped the um, organization of the agricultural revolution. Of course, to organize crops and fields and so on, societies, um, civilizations had to settle around um, favorable lands for agriculture. So we talked about different uh, river valleys, like the Nile Valley, the Indus Valley, Mesopotamia, and so on. In phase three, we saw the steam revolution appear. So we had the first production and consumption and bundling. We could produce something here and consume it somewhere else because transportation costs drastically decreased due to the development of railroads, um, of cargo ships, and so on. In phase four, we talked about the ITC or ICT revolution, information uh, technology and communication or information and communication technology revolution. We had a further unbundling, but this time about the different stages, stages of production due to a lower cost of moving ideas. So now we can get something produced um, through different stages, through different firms, through different countries. So we don't talk about a country having a comparative advantage anymore. We talk about firms having a comparative advantage in the production of that specific part. I talked about the whole process of uh, developing an industry for a developing uh, country in particular. Instead of building a supply chain like before, then developing countries or developing countries firms can just join a supply chain chain and little by little take more activities in the chain if they want to build their industry. So this organization of phases can help us understand international trade and globalization. It helps us understand trade patterns at different points in time. There are other organizations of economic times. So if you take other economics courses, you're going to go through different cycles. There are things, uh, there are things like innovative cycles, innovation cycles, um, real business cycles. Um, there was another, some kind of growth cycles. We went over um, commodity super cycles. That was another way to look at the unfolding of the second unbundling. But 
the different industrial revolutions help us understanding the uh, trade and production patterns in the world. So, an industrial revolution is a period of significant innovations bringing with it big changes in the economy, the, in the economy and new growth once these innovations get absorbed. The absorption of innovations can take time. If you remember the steam uh, revolution, we had to look at more than 50 years to see um, railroads to be dense enough for transportation to be easy and so on and so forth. So some, some innovations take time to, um, to be adopted. But typically it's a period during which there is a surge of innovations. These innovations take time, yeah, take time to be absorbed. Although now they take less time than they used to. So we could say that industrial revolutions are um, to innovations and large economic changes what bundling or unbundling is to international trade. So let's date those revolutions. The first industrial revolution would be the steam revolution. Note that when I talked about the first unbundling, I dated it starting 1820. Here, the first industrial revolution is said to have started around 1760. And this reflects this idea that it takes time to adopt these innovations before, uh, before there's a change in um, the organization of the economy. So here, the technological breakthrough was mechanical power, allowing employment shift from farm to factory. The steam engine changes transportation and international trade from 1820s, which is pretty much when the first unbundling is said to have started. But it changed production earlier through mechanization, especially in industries such as textile. So here is a link to uh, something called flying shuttles that allowed the UK to have a head start in, in terms of growth and in terms of uh, industrialization. Back then in the 1760s, Europe was still at war. Um, yeah, the, the uh, French Revolution was not there yet. So the France was still under a king, Louis XVI, I think, in 1760. While in um, the UK, flying shuttles were engines where devices that were used to um, in the textile industry to saw things way faster than a man could do it by hand. So the flying shuttle is the staple of the first industrial revolution with steam engines. It continued with the widespread use of machinery in manufacturing, large scale production of steel and iron, Rapid expansion of transportation networks, increased use of oil as um, a source of combustion. The second industrial revolution actually is not related to the second unbundling. It happened before the second unbundling. This is the revolution that was triggered by electricity. So that was uh, that dates back to 1870 all the way to around 1914, pretty much until World War One. And the breakthrough here was the advent of electricity, leading to more sophisticated machines. So the scale and scope of mechanization become much deeper. In fact, it is also around those years that. Um, that the fractionalization of the production process increased. So you heard of Fordism. Ford had this whole conveyor belt organization where one person assembles one piece, the piece goes on the belt, 
onto the next worker who assembles another piece and so on and so forth. This is still the case in many factories nowadays. In particular, in the pharmaceutical industry, where you have uh, machines that are going to create, for example, pills. They're going to put uh, the product in the pill. The pills are going to go to another, to another um, spot on the belt, and so on and so forth. Some of those spots are taken by human beings who have to, let's say, um, maybe put some pills into some holes, then into some molds, then the molds go onto a machine. The machine uh, is like some kind of a press that is going to uh, press the molds and the pills are going to come out in a different, maybe in a different way, maybe with color. You know, those pills sometimes are like half blue, half white. That'll be it. Then the mold uh, goes onto another person who's going to take, who's going to kind of break the mold or at least empty the mold into a big pool. So all the pills are going to be in a big pool. Then this pool is going to go somewhere else where another worker is going to check if all the pills are good and is going to maybe take some of the bad pills out. Maybe some of the pills that where the paint didn't uh, apply, like the, the colorant didn't apply, or some of them which are broken and so on and so forth. On to the next one who is going to maybe box them. So he's going to select, let's say, make groups of 10 and put them in a specific box. On to the next one who is going to put a tag on the box. On to the next one who's going to take them for shipping. In the cheese factory I worked in, we are we are pretty much have the same process, but it's not the entire process. We have a first process where the milk comes in to a press, is being heated at a certain temperature, and it becomes kind of solid. It becomes like kind of tofu. Then it's put in a mold, being thoroughly pressed. We take it out of the molds. We put them in another type of mold. Then this mold, the smalls, individual molds are going to be put in a room where the cheese is going to stay for a couple of weeks. It's going to dry pretty much. Then somebody's going to take them out. Then they're going to go to another place. Finally, they're going to get wrapped up. Then you put a specific tag to them depending on where they go, depending on what product they are. Finally, they go to shipping and somebody is bringing them to the truck and the truck is going to uh, deliver the cheeses wherever they have to go. It's pretty much the process of making cheese. <laughs> okay. The third industrial revolution is pretty close to, to the second bundling. It again started before the second bundling due to the time it takes to adopt these innovations. Here the breakthrough is the computerization leading to an employment shift from factory to the office. So back in the 1970s, computers were invented. They uh, allowed many tasks to be handled digitally rather than by hand. Think about an accountant. Back then, an accountant had to report every single number in an accounting book, had to compute them with a calculator or even back in the days, they had manual calculators. They had ways to, calc to, to do computations without an actual calculator. So that led an employment shift from the factory to the office. The adoption of computers and associated inventions. So barcodes were a huge invention, invention back in the days. They allowed many retail stores to proceed to do inventories very fast. They can just check barcodes um, and that the barcode would directly record the product into the database of the store. Caching machines, personal computers, word processor. So then you could start typing letters rather than uh, writing them by hand or typing them with the old uh, machine. Spreadsheet software. Imagine how handling data, how hard it was to handle data back then. To record data, you had to input the data manually in a book. Now you can input them in a software. You can even program the way it's going to input. You can what we what we call um, scrape data online. So you can use a small command to uh, extract data from a website online. Two weeks ago, I learned how to scrape data from YouTube, for instance. So I use a platform where you can write a, a couple of comments. 
to go to the API, which is an interface um, on YouTube that allows you to extract information from any video that you like. So if you want to extract data about YouTube and look at, you know, the influence of the number of followers on the number of views or and so on and so forth, you can write a command, an automatic command that is going to extract all the information about certain videos. And by all, I mean, you can extract everything. You can, you can extract the number of views, the number of comments. You can extract all the comments if you want to. You can extract the number of followers of the YouTube channel and so on and so forth. Now, here, I put question marks here because it is not clear yet whether the third industrial revolution is over or not. There are still, um, there are still innovations to this day, which are very, very um, quickly adopted. So it's not clear whether we are still in the, industri in the third industrial revolution or whether we are in the fourth one. The fourth one is said to have started in 2016, where the breakthrough is machine learning. So some of you in the chat, some of you in the course are actually already studying machine learning. There is an abuse of language uh, when we talk about machine learning. Machine learning has existed since the invention of computers. Okay. But machine learning, as we talk about it today, is a rather recent phenomenon. So that led to an employment shift from services jobs to sheltered services jobs. This, this uh, revolution is also called the Industry 4.0. The idea of machine learning is that you program a computer to execute a task, okay, that's that would be before machine learning, okay? It's like you're on Excel, you're asking Excel to do something, it does it for you. The idea about machine learning is that then you only have to feed data or new inputs to the computer and the computer will automatically execute those tasks. And in fact, what we mean by learning is the computer is going to get better at it over time. So instead of every time running the software manually, now you can only, you just have to input whatever data, you have to just put whatever data you have into the algorithm and then the algorithm does the job for you. Machine learning is used in every, uh, almost in every sphere of, um, in every industry, almost. Um, facial recognition is one of them, which is huge. Um, pattern recognition. So if you want to recognize any pattern in general, that could be pictures, that could be um, words on a piece of text. So machine learning can be used to um, spot plagiarism, for instance. It is used in any sort of data science. Amazon hires people who know about machine learning all the time. Amazon in particular, because they hire a lot of economists. It's used in economics more and more. Um, it's used for self-driving cars. If you buy a self-driving car, the more you use the car, the more data will be input into the car. And so the more uh, experience the car is going to absorb to be better the next time you use it. Yes, in general, machine learning is used for predictive analysis. It's used for uh, predictions. Yeah. Among, um, in the fourth industrial revolution, you can find the internet of things, the fact that things are connected now. So it could be your watch, your phone, and so on. All those things now are connected to the internet, not just computers. Machine to machine communication. So all those things are, link, are links to Wikipedia pages. So I recommend you to take a look at them. And that leads to enhanced humans. Elon Musk uh, mentioned that on some podcasts. He said that, well, we are already technically enhanced. If you look at your phone, uh, most of you guys have a smartphone, probably all of you. 
Even though you don't have data, you still might have access to Wi-Fi. And as soon as you have access to Wi-Fi, you have access to all of the knowledge of the world. So it's not that you have a chip in your brain that allows you to download information directly to your brain, but it's pretty close. You can just pull up a device and in a couple of touches, check anything, um, anything you want to. But Elon Musk is also working on some actual um, neural connections. I think he has something called Neuralink. I don't know how far he is right now, but that could be a way to enhance humans further. And it is still open whether this revolution is distinct from the third or if it's an extension of the third, which is why um, I put question marks in the third revolution. Those question marks here are to say that this revolution is not over. It is just the beginning and it's, uh, it's happening fast. Yes, Neuralink, yeah. So the first industrial revolution has reached every country in the world, but not in uh, the same way and has not reached everybody. Up to this day, about 17% of the world population does not have access to electricity and thus access to the second industrial revolution. This is a fortiori true for the third industrial revolution as well. About 50% of the world population still has no access to the internet. And North Korea. They could have access to the internet if they wanted to. Just North Korea has different reasons. So if you don't have access to the internet or to some sort of a um, worldwide network, how can you even hope to go to the fourth industrial revolution, which is about automa automa aut automatizing, automizing, making it automatic. Uh, thank you. Automating, automating the uh, pretty much the third industrial revolution. So how the how did these industrial revolutions affect work and labor markets? It's important to assess how it's going to evolve from now on. So let's go through the first. The first industrial revolution made machines and mechanization efficient. So we had an increase for workers who know how to operate these machines. If it takes low skilled workers to operate the machines, there was still an increase in low skilled, uh, an increased demand uh, for low skilled workers. There was a decreased demand for skilled workers. And by skilled workers, I'm not talking about something, someone who necessarily has 10 years of um, university education, but rather somebody who has a specific knowledge, a skill. And in particular, think about artisans. Is it a French? Is it a, well, it's definitely a French word. I don't know if it, if it makes sense in English, but artisan, artisan are the ones who have very specific knowledge about what they make. So typically, people who uh, make, for instance, um, handmade shoes. So if you think about handmade leather boots, that would be the work of an artisan, typically. Or sculpture, anything related to um, carving stone or, um, or um, yeah, or carving wood and things like that. Sculptors, yeah. The idea is that artisans, although what they produce is probably high quality, is rather inefficient in terms of time. They need to put a lot of time to produce one single unit. And the cost of it is going to be higher. Machines allow you to produce things which are, of course, not as customized, maybe not as high quality, but they allow you to produce a, well, a shitload of them, which thanks to internal economies of scale, um, decrease the unit cost of production. 
So instead of a long apprenticeship, usually it takes two, three years, to learn how to produce a low volume of product, a less skilled worker could operate a machine producing a high volume of goods. So yes, now, um, artisans, what they produce is part of a niche market, exactly. It's more of a, if you have the money to pay for a, um, a customized leather jacket, then you're going to pay for a customized leather jacket. Otherwise, you're going to pay for maybe your leather jacket, but the leather jacket that was produced in a series somewhere else. Like it produced in large scale by a, um, a famous brand. Would be the same for, it, it's, it's a lot, it's, it's the case for leather products in particular, where you can find true leather produced in high scale, like standardized production, but also you can find um, kind of tailors who are going to create some leather product which are going to be tailored for you. But that's a higher end. Back then, everybody, not everybody, but many people would go to a tailor uh, on a regular basis to get things readjusted or to get things produced for, um, for their own body. Now, when you go to a tailor, you're going to pay a higher price. And usually you're going to go to a tailor with something that you purchased for a low price. Something that I actually used to do a lot back home. There used to be an old lady in my neighborhood who would make adjustments to clothing, to clothes. So I would buy a very cheap pair of pants, sturdy pants, but not well tailored, you know, very, not baggy, but you know, straight, very basic. I would bring, I would bring those pants to her and in her free time for five euros, she would tailor the pants to my legs. So I would bring it to her and I would say, mm, I want my legs to be tighter. I want the pants to be tighter here or maybe wider there. Oh, can you adjust this in this way? And so on. I would pay five extra euros and I would get a tailored pair of pants. Pretty nice. But if you look for somebody who is making this for a living, you're going to have to pay a way higher price. So the quality of the good may be lower, but the price is way lower. And more people can purchase these goods. In the second industrial revolution, machines and firms were able to produce larger volumes of production and exploit internal economies of scale thanks to um, electricity in particular. So it continued to increase the overall demand for less skilled workers to operate those machines. It also increased the relative demand for higher skilled workers. But what type of skills? not artisans. But more skilled workers were needed to manage the production floor and the team of workers. Some machines would also be maybe complicated to operate. So some skilled workers would be, would be needed to either operate those machines or trained, train the less skilled workers to operate them. Always good to have an engineer here and there when you have uh, all of these machines to operate. There was also a higher demand for white collar workers. So usually which are also more skilled workers because non-production workers increased. So white collars as mass production required an increased effort to sell more products over more distant markets. Now that you don't only sell to your, um, in your neighborhood, to your city where you just need to do local advertising, if you want to sell at a national level or international level, then you need white collars to start getting in touch with business partners, getting in touch with customers, getting in touch with retailers and so on and so forth. Quickly, let's go over producing a Ford T. Ford T was, I don't know if it's the first model of uh, Ford cars, but it's the the staple of them, the one that came from the factories back in the uh, 1900s. So here is a link to, um, to a more thorough description of how it's made. It was designed in 1908 and took 12 hours to produce one car. In 1913, 1914 is when 
Ford came up with the assembly line to produce the Model T. And it was specifically designed to have unskilled workers. 84 steps were required to produce the car. A worker would be trained for only one of these steps. So work would be very alienating because for eight hours they would do literally the same thing, which still happens to this day, by the way. But that is one of the reasons, one of the reasons workers back then would show up at work drunk. The work was very automatic, not very interesting, would not require um, a lot of brain power. So some of them would just swap waste at work and be able to get it done. By 1925, after World War I, between the two world wars, a car took less than two hours to produce. So standardizing the production to the extreme allows you to make tremendous um, well, economies of scale, in particular due to the reduction in um, production time. But in order to have uh, to design an optimal production process, they needed more engineers to organize the assembly line and white colors to sell the cars. This is also back then that um, advertising flourished. Yes, marketing, absolutely. Using billboards, going to the radio, asking the radio, you know, every, every hour to, to have a five minutes break um, for, uh, for commercials. Then when uh, the TV appeared in the 1950s, even more so, uh, even more so for marketing and so on. But the way optimally organizing the production process needed specialized um, specialized knowledge and this is where engineers would kick in they would say it's better to put this worker there then he goes to this machine then he doesn't get in the way of this guy who is going to assemble this thing at the same time and then this third person is going to receive those two pieces and assemble them together send them to that other place where another machine is going to operate and so on Eleven thirty-one. Isn't that a good time for a break? Let's resume at eleven forty. Okay, eleven forty-one, eleven forty-two.
Okay, let's go back to it. So, in order to understand how industrial revolutions affected the labor market and in which way, I'm going to use some uh, labor market models. So I'm going to use a couple of graphs and uh, I'll ask you to bear with me on these ones and let me know in the chat if you need me to slow down. So, let's go through a labor market model. We know that the wages of skilled workers are higher than the wages of less skilled workers. It's just, uh, in general, of course, in general, this is something we observe. During the second industrial revolution, the ratio of skilled workers' wages to less skilled worker wages did not change a lot, despite having a higher demand for skilled workers. So, because of the second industrial revolution, the blue curve, which is the labor demand, shifted to the right. So what is this curve? Labor demand comes from firms. It is the labor that is asked by a firm. A firm needs labor to produce. On the X axis, you can find the letter L, which corresponds to labor. It could be um, expressed in terms of hours or in terms of number of workers. The Y axis, W, is going to be the wage. So this is the, um, the wage at which workers are getting paid. Now, because of a higher demand for skilled workers due to the second industrial revolution, firms are now willing to offer a higher wage for the same amount of hours as before. So this shift can be, li can be looked at two ways. Take one point here, let's say this one. This corresponds to this amount of labor. Now that there's an increase in demand for labor, at that precise wage, firms are now willing to hire more workers. So at the same wage, worker firms now want to hire more workers because they need more of these workers. Because of that, since there's a high demand for workers, firms are going to post job offers online I mean, right now. And so if there is a higher demand for workers for the same supply, supply comes from us, we supply our time, we supply our skills. Then if there's a higher demand on supply, the new equilibrium will be where the wage is now higher. Because firms require more labor, they are going to compensate workers more. In fact, this shift in the labor demand is also reflects a shift in marginal productivity of labor. If you're paid up to the amount you produce, then if you are more productive, thanks to the second industrial revolution, then firms will pay you more. So in principle, we should see a higher wage for skilled workers. Yes, not only they hire more workers, but they also pay them more because now they're more productive thanks to the innovations of the second industrial revolution. However, we did not see a big change in the ratio of skilled worker wages to less skilled worker wages. This is also because the supply of skilled workers at the same time increased due to education. And this is what the right graph shows. The labor supply comes from us. So imagine the labor supply for skilled workers. Okay. All both of these graphs apply to skilled workers. So there's a high demand for skilled workers. So in principle, they should get paid more. However, we did not observe 
such a big difference. The idea is that at the same time, there was an increase in the labor supply of skilled workers due to better education in general. So the red curve, the labor supply, also shifted. What that means is that for the same wage as before, which was here, now workers, ourselves, are willing to work more. We are willing to work more hours. This comes from the fact that there is an, there is an extra amount of skilled applicants. So it's not necessarily that you personally, you want to work more for the same wage as before. It's just that now there are many more people which are as skilled as you are, who are willing to work. And you can see that the new equilibrium happens at the point L prime. So there's a higher amount of workers, not only because there's higher demand for them, but also because there is a higher supply of them. But this higher number of workers or this higher number of hours at equilibrium happens for the same wage as before. Of course, here it's a specific case where I made the shift in both curves such that the wage at equilibrium remains the same. If the labor supply curve did not shift as much, if the red curve here was here instead, then the new equilibrium would be a bit higher for a higher wage and vice versa. So the second graph here on the right is just an explanation of, is the complete explanation, explanation of why the ratio of skilled worker wages to less skilled worker wages did not change. The left graph just shows an increase in demand due to the second industrial revolution. The right graph shows that at the same time, or maybe a bit later, they all, there was also an increase in the supply of skilled workers due to education so that wages did not change that much. So it's a demand and supply diagram, but for labor. The price of an hour of labor is equal to the wage. This is the price a firm has to pay if they hire you for one um, hour of labor. Now, let's go over the third industrial revolution. The third industrial revolution is, you know, the, the appearance of computers, um, internet and so on. So this had an impact on skilled versus less skilled wages, starting in the 1980s, leading to more inequalities between skilled and less skilled workers. So if you divide workers between unskilled, medium skilled and skilled, the ratio of skilled to medium and the ratio of skilled to unskilled increase from the 1980s, which means that either what's at the bottom decreased, which is medium skilled wages or unskilled wages decreased, or what's at the top skilled workers wages increased. Well, it's going to be the latter. The wages of skilled workers increased. The increased use of cheaper computers is the main reason. People who had skills before, but were using, were doing their work by hand. I'm thinking about accountants. I'm thinking about uh, lawyers and so on. Are now more productive thanks to the use of computers. So. This resulted into an increase in the return to education and skills. Now being an accountant brings more money than being an accountant in the 80s or in the 70s. So let's go over quickly how a wage is being um, is being computed. When a worker is paid according to the contribution he or she makes, so of course, it's a specific condition when in particular here we talk about 
perfect competition, but that's a model. The wage would be W wage is equal to P times MPL. So let's detail uh, those letters. W is the wage of the worker. P is the price of the product that the worker is going to produce. And MPL stands for marginal product of labor or marginal productivity of the worker. It is equal to the number of units produced by one extra hour of work. If you've taken other class, other econ classes before, you might have heard of the term marginal in different things, marginal product, marginal utility, marginal cost, and so on, marginal revenue. Every time you see the word, the word marginal in an econ class, it means one extra unit of something. So marginal product of labor means production coming from one extra hour of work or one extra worker, depending on how you quantify work. But if you think about marginal revenue, you will think about the amount of sales made by one extra, by selling one extra unit of the good. If you think about marginal utility, you would think about the extra happiness, the extra utility coming from an extra unit of the good being consumed. And for those of you who already know what calculus is, every time you hear the word marginal in economics, you're going to have to take a derivative. Just so you know. So the idea of this model is that the wage is equal to the value of the marginal product of a worker times how much money this marginal product is worth. If your marginal product, if, if you work one extra hour and you produce 10 units of the good and each unit is sold for $2, then you're going to be paid 2 times 10 equals $20. That's in perfect competition, okay? I want to emphasize that again. It's a specific case, but it's just to give you an idea of how um, wages are computed in general. A firm usually pays you, or the way you're paid, uh, is supposed to reflect your productivity one way or another. Sometimes it's exactly equal to your marginal productivity of labor. Like, oops, sorry. Like uh, what I'm showing here. Sometimes your wage is a bit higher than that. So, typically a skilled worker is paid a higher wage than a less skilled worker because the marginal productivity of labor is higher. The price would be the same of the product, but since this is higher for skilled worker, skilled workers will get paid more. So, suppose the production of a good requires medium skilled workers, medium skilled inputs and skilled workers. Medium skilled inputs come in two forms. You either have a medium skilled workers or you have computers. You can consider computer as being medium skilled because, well, you still have to operate it. It's not working on its own. In the chat, I am asked, why is it per extra hour of work? Well, the idea is that your first hour of work might not be as productive as your last hour of work during the day. So when you want to maximize your profit, if, you, um, if a firm wants to maximize its profit, it's going to apply some calculus rules. So it's going to take some derivative. And what you're going to see is the wage will be equal to the productivity of one hour extra, one extra hour of work. So I just want, I don't want to get into the model. Um, I don't want to get into the model right now, but the idea is that it's not about just one hour of work. It's this idea that over time, as the more you work, the less productive you are in general. Or same thing as marginal utility. 
the more booze you drink, the less enjoyable it gets. Yes, the more drunk you get, and maybe when you're very drunk, you enjoy an extra drink, but usually the first sip, the first beer, is way better than the 10th. And so the idea is that the amount of money you're willing to pay for beer is going to be equal to what that precise beer is going to bring you. If I come from the desert, I'm thirsty, or I had three hours, I had a workout of three hours and I didn't drink, and you tell me I'm going to sell you a bottle of water, I could give you 10 bucks for a bottle of water if there is no water around. But if you give me 10 bottles of water, if I already had water, and then you tell me the next bottle of water is $10, I'm like, nah, man, I, I'm not thirsty enough to pay $10 for a, for a bottle of water. I'm willing to pay maybe a dollar because eventually I'm going to have to drink it. I'm, I'm going to need to drink it. For athletes, it can be the same thing. There is an optimal amount of time an athlete should stay on the field before having to, um, to, be, um, to be replaced by a teammate. It's not that you have to wait for the, for the guy to be gassed out. Because if he's gassed out, next time his teammate is gassed out, this guy might not be as productive when he comes back on the field. So what you want to do is roll them on a regular basis and prevent them from gassing out. Because it takes a longer time to recover when you're gassed out. Well, the idea is just that the wage is going to be a single wage. You won't be paid, you won't be paid a different wage for each hour of work. It's just that the wage for everybody is going to be um, decided such that... How can I explain this? I won't be able to explain this without uh, putting any math in there. So um, I'd, rather, uh, I'd rather move on. Um, sorry about that. But the idea is to reflect the fact that productivity is not uh it's a model um i'm talking about a model here of course so i don't want to get into the model without talking about the model so um i'm gonna have to move on sorry about that so medium skilled inputs we have medium skilled workers and we have computers and they are substitutes a computer could be, re could, be could replace a worker and vice versa to some extent Okay, that's the assumption here. Of course, you still need somebody to um, use to operate the computer. The idea is that medium skilled inputs, whether it's a medium skilled worker or a medium or a computer, are going to complement the work of a skilled worker. For instance, a lawyer is more efficient with the help of a legal assistant searching for the relevant cases. A department needs more support staff when it grows larger. A CFO will be happy to have the assistance of accountants, which are not uh, necessarily expert accountants, but who are in charge of um, which are in charge of bookkeeping. Skilled workers perform complex and non-routine tasks that computers are unable to do, but computers can help them with these tasks. Typically, a CFO or a lawyer, when they do their job, they can use a computer to do it, but they don't have to use a computer because at the end of the day, what they have to do is make a decision. They have to tell the CEO or they have to tell the client about a certain decision they make. The computer can assist them or the assistant accountant can assist them in helping them make these decisions. So it's going to complement them. It's going to help skilled workers be more productive. So the marginal product of a skilled worker depends on medium skilled inputs, which is why I have brackets with an M here. MPLS, S for skilled, L for labor. So the marginal product of a skilled labor, worker, depends on the amount of, uh, of medium-skilled inputs that are being put in it. I'm going to give you uh, an example. I guess I can, be 
I can be considered as a skilled worker when I do research. Okay? Not that my research is great, but in my research, I need computers to perform some statistical computations. In particular, I need to run what we call simulations. You create fake data to see if your statistical tools, the one you came up with, are working better than the tools that somebody else has or that are being used by somebody else. So you have to program the whole thing and you have to run it for many, many iterations. You have to run it many, many times. So you have to create a lot of data sets and see if on average you do better or if you don't do better on average among other uh, measures. Well, right now I have a paper that I would like to make with a friend, but both of us have shitty computers and we cannot run a high, an, um, high scale simulation that would fit our needs. Once I get a good computer for that, then I will just run my computer for two weeks, run a bunch of computations, and then I'll be able to finish the paper. It's just one example among others. So the greater the M, the higher the marginal product of a skilled worker. Now, the marginal product of a skilled of a, of a medium skilled input, be it a worker or a computer, does not directly depend on skilled labor. Okay? How productive my computer is has nothing to do with me. I'm not the one who made the computer. Okay? So, if there is a higher demand for skilled workers due to the increase in computers or the fact that they are cheaper or the fact that they are more efficient or in general better, then the marginal product of a skilled worker will shift to the right. So everything else being equal, a skilled worker becomes more productive with a computer than with some staff. Simply because now a computer is just more efficient faster than a uh, than its rival medium skilled worker with computers a firm does not need as many staff members to run efficiently so given the supply of skilled labor the real wage of skilled labor rises that's if the labor supply is kept constant. That's if the number of skilled workers is constant. Every year, the same number of people graduate from university, for instance. So, let's look at the effect of computers on the market for medium skilled labor. M, medium skilled, uh, medium skilled input, is decomposed, that's just an example here, it's a model, okay, is decomposed into medium skill labor, LM, plus computers. When computers get cheaper, easier to use and can perform more tasks, the demand for medium skill labor falls and so is the real wage of medium skilled labor. Since now you can substitute computers for uh, medium skilled workers and computers are actually better. You don't need as many medium skilled workers anymore. So the demand for medium skilled workers is actually going to shift to the left. So if you imagine the previous graph, imagine this graph is for medium skilled workers. Instead of a shift to the right, you would see a shift to the left because computers now are better and so they can more easily replace a medium skilled worker. But remember that people choose their occupations. So if on one year they see that computers are getting better, those who are medium skilled or those who are about to choose what type of skills to acquire might make a different decision. If wages fall in medium skilled occupations and wage rises uh, in skilled occupations, more and more people are going to choose skilled occupations. 
they see that now being a, a lawyer or being a CFO um, yields more, more money than before for the same training. So they're going to have an incentive to acquire these skills, regardless of whether they are gifted or not. Just pays more. As the price of computer and computing goes down, more and more people will choose skilled occupations. And this is how we also have the shift in the labor supply I talked about before. Most of the time, and I say most, people go to the sector where, uh, where money is the best. So not everybody is doing finance, although finance in finance money is nice. Of course, there are different factors coming into this decision. How uh, gifted you are, how talented you are. You might not be good with numbers and be good with analytical skills or the other way around, or um, you might like something more than another. So you might just go for something because you like it, not because of the money prospects you're gonna have after you graduate. Many things are gonna come into consideration when deciding what type of skills you're gonna acquire. And you guys in Econ 102 are, haven't declared a major yet for most of you. So it's gonna be time soon. It's gonna be time to decide where to go. And definitely you're gonna look at, oh, I had a couple of Econ classes, I like them, or I didn't. Or, but you can make maybe good money in Econ. Trade off, and so on and so forth. But this, um, this um, dynamic, is going to describe the relative situation between skilled, medium skilled and unskilled labor until the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. Unskilled laborers are still in relative demand because you cannot totally remove humans from factories, at least not yet. Maybe after the fourth industrial revolution, it will be made possible with full automation of the production process with machine to machine communication. But there's still a, a certain amount of jobs which cannot be replaced and which are unskilled. So because of um, these consequences, a government needs to pay attention, very close attention to the type of economies, uh, sorry, the type of economic policies to um, conduct in order to avoid bad consequences. What is the net effect of industrial revolutions on jobs? Every industrial revolution has changed the relative demand among different levels of skills. In particular, industrial revolutions, new technologies, um, have a destructive effect on jobs. Skilled artisans lost their jobs after the first industrial revolution. Semi-skilled workers with a third, so the medium-skilled workers, same thing. And every time, it created fears that technology would outpace, outpace the creation of jobs and fears that unemployment might be widespread due to the fact that innovations go faster than jobs are being created. So there will be eventually a total replacement of jobs, at least of some types of jobs. Keynes in 31 wrote, Due to our discovery of means of economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. And that explains in particular anti-innovation actions. In the 1800s, there was a movement led by, uh, in the UK, led by the Ludits. I'm not even sure I'm saying it the right way. You can check uh, what the Ludits are online. It's a group of people who were protesting against the flying shuttle. So they were working in the textile industry and many of them lost their jobs because they were not in high demand due to being replaced by those flying shuttles who could get the job done faster. So some of them started breaking flying shuttles and protesting in the street 
um, as an anti-innovation movement. Nowadays, we don't have that a lot because most people are pretty happy about the use of technology. Many people are happy to have very good suggestion when they go to a website to buy some things. Amazon suggesting you to buy something that is tailored for you is machine learning. They use all the data from your past uh, browsing trips and uh, other customers to group you, to put you in different groups with similar characteristics as other people. And this is how on Amazon you get the other people also bought this. Because usually if you buy, let's say, a camera, chances are that you might buy what comes with it. You might buy a specific uh, camera case or you might buy maybe a specific lens. So they often, Amazon often suggests you a whole bundle that contains the camera, the lens, and the bag. When I bought my green screen, Amazon said, hey, other people also bought this. What they proposed me was um, a stand to put the green screen on and light projectors, which I am using right now. Because usually if you buy one thing, you buy the whole set. Well, not usually, other customers did. So there are different views about innovations. Here are two pessimistic views. Marx, of course, is always there, you know, and Leon Tief, which is a bit more interesting. So Marx is about the replacement of labor by the machine. So the machine becomes a competitor for um, a competitor of the workman himself. Leontiev is making an analogy with um, horses. The same way we stop using horses in agriculture, firms might stop, might stop using humans for industries. And this is pretty much what, uh, well, Leontiev was thinking about. But there are some optimistic views. There are some beneficial employment effects. They might be long-term, they might be hard to see and hard to quantify, but they are long-term beneficial and employment effects. There is one more optimistic view that I didn't mention, but there's this idea that labor in general, especially the labor that is being replaced, is grueling. You know, eight hours of work in a factory and so on is not for everybody. And many of those people don't have any energy to invest in their personal development um, activities. So they go home and now that they have access to Netflix, they just become a couch potato at home, watch Netflix, go to bed and um, repeat the next day. So there's this idea that maybe innovations might free humans from labor or at least from the shitty labor. And that also supports the argument behind the universal basic income. That would be an income that everybody can perceive without having to work. The idea is that if jobs keep being replaced, then many people will be without a job, first of all, in the short run. And in the long run, maybe the annoying work, the physical work that maybe nobody wants to do, will be replaced. Maybe there will still be some skilled works, work, like, you know, lawyers, policemen, those people will never be re replaced. But those who don't necessarily have these skills might still be able to survive without having to work. Uh, Manitoba did an experiment. Oh, I didn't know. I knew that, uh, I think it's Finland who's working on it. One Scandinavian country, either Finland, Sweden, or Norway. Um, but... The funding is also another issue because if you want to fund universal healthcare and universal basic income, then you're going to run into uh, deficits pretty quickly. So with the fourth industrial revolution, same fears exist. So before getting into the fourth industrial revolution, let's get into uh, the impact of the previous revolutions on jobs. 
First of all, industrial revolutions destroy jobs. I mentioned this many times. But they also create jobs, either in different sectors or in different industries, or in the same industry, but at a different level in the production process. And yes, industrial revolutions disrupt industries. They make some jobs obsolete, create unemployment, but they lead to new jobs, new firms, new industries. Things are moving constantly. It can be hard. It can be a hard um, pill to swallow when you lose your job because a machine is replacing you, and chances are you will never find a job like yours ever again. I agree, hard to swallow, but. If you live in a liberal economy, then you have to suck it up, you know, move on and maybe learn something new or go to another, go to another type of trade and so on. So industrial revolutions like globalization change, uh, like globalization change relative prices, which create winners and losers as usual gains and pain. Uh, they use there's going to be innovations are going to lead to sunset sectors and to sunrise sectors. You just have to know which sector is the sunrise sector and um, you know, make your own spot in it until the next one. But so far, every industrial revolution created more jobs than it destroyed. Of course, we can look at that in hindsight because all of these revolutions happened a long time ago. But in the short run, definitely what people remember most is the destructive effect. The demand effect usually takes time to emerge. Two examples. Since the 19th century, developed economies have moved from having 90% of the workforce on land to less than 2% today. Massive reallocation of labor having occurred with minimal social disruptions and unemployment. Same is true for manufacturing. Today, Canada and US employs more or sorry, less uh, than 9% of their workforce in manufacturing. So from agriculture, from the field to the factory, from the factory to the office. That's what we saw with uh, previous industrial revolutions. Now, from the office, with the fourth industrial revolution, we are going to the home office. Yeah. A short view vision is since 2008, the app industry, so application industry, has moved from being non-existent because, well, before smartphones, there was no such thing as applications, you know, on the old Nokia phones to a 100 billion industry surpassing in importance the film industry, which is 100 years old. Let's look at an illustration, ATMs and bank employment. ATMs are great. You don't need to go to a bank teller and say, hi, how are you? Here is my credit card. Give me some money, please. Or here is my debit card, my checking account. Give me some money. In fact, both the number of ATMs and employment in banks have increased. First of all, digital revolution made possible the creation of ATMs to do simple and routine bank tellers tasks. So get cash, deposit checks, transfers, and so on. If you come for, if you go to an ATM from your bank, you can even check the, your balance for different bank accounts and things like that. The number of bank tellers plummeted and the cost of operating a branch decreased. You don't need five bank tellers anymore because there is a couple of ATMs on the side. So you only need one or two bank tellers now, which is usually what you see. And you see people working in the background, like the advisors and so on, which those guys have appointments. But pure bank tellers per bank, typically one or two. What did the banks do? Well. They managed to open more branches to get more competition, to be more competitive. And they also reallocated their bank tellers. They also removed them into financial advising and to the provision of other 
services. The result of this has been twofold. More branches, more bank employees because you have more branches. So you still need a couple of tailors in the new, in the new, uh, in the new branches. And there is a higher focus on the provision of bank related services like investment, uh, financial advisors and so on. And also you have more ATMs. Now you have higher skilled bank employees. They are being more productive as well because they work with computers. So if you, instead of going to the ATM, you go to the bank teller to uh, deposit something or to register for some direct deposits and so on, computers also allow them to get the job done fast. And that's because computers complement their tasks. The same way computers complement the tasks of an accountant. The banking industry is a good illustration of what happened in the economy during the third industrial revolution. Jobs get obsolete as they are replaced by a machine, but jobs get created. Those jobs are higher skilled. So of course they need, uh, they need people to train themselves. And they are also in demand because computers act as a complement for these workers. Let's end the lecture here today. I am going to um, I'm going to cover the last part of this lecture next week after the quiz. Okay. In particular, I will talk about net employment effect and the effect of elasticities, uh, the impact of the importance of elasticities on um, on these employment effects. In the meantime, have a good week and. See you in the next one. Bye.